Hey, we're going to get started. We have a lot to get through today, so I want to uh, use all uh, the time allotted. Uh, thanks for staying for this late session and waiting on that first beer. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, we're here to ask some big questions about big data. My name is Jim Adler. I'm the VP of Data and Chief Privacy Officer at iNOM. You can uh, check me out on Twitter at Jim under Adler, or I blog about these sorts of topics at jimadler.me. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, about four things today, uh, sort of an overture and play in three acts, a little bit about me and iNome, uh, a little strata redux of how we got here, a felon classifier that we designed to drive some of these discussions and some closing arguments about some of the policy implications. As for me, uh, I, although there's chief privacy officer in my title, I'm not an attorney. Uh, I'm an engineer with a background in signal processing and software and systems. I think I need to make uh, that disclosure uh, early. Uh, about iNome, uh, we are a, a, a big data people engine that powers a bunch of sites on the web, uh, Intellius being uh, probably the most uh, well known. Uh, we handle structured and unstructured data, about 10 years in the making of this platform. Uh, we serve about a million visitors a day uh, in our si uh, through our sites using this platform. We have APIs uh, that support third party apps. We've recently done that. You can check us out at developer.inome.com. So where we started and why we, are, why we founded uh, 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 this new company uh, was really to get back to uh, understanding where all this data is coming from and what's driving it. I, you know, when towns were small about 150 years ago, uh, everyone knew everyone. And we were very tightly connected. There's an old Oscar Wilde quote, which I love, that says, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. And, and I think that when I grew up for a time in Greensboro, Alabama, the, the population was like 1,200. If you cut school, the whole town knows by dinner. I have more Twitter followers now than, not that I'm bragging, <laughs> than, than Greensboro, Alabama has in population. And so there is a hunger, I would argue, uh, that as we've uh, grown into these urban, urban centers and anonymized uh, uh, our, our existence, there's this hunger to understand the information that is out there. And I think the search engines, Google, Bing, have brought that to the fore. And social media has, has quenched that thirst for interaction. And we've sort of coined this, this term social genomics, uh, which if you think about INOME is the uh, contraction of information uh, and, and genome. Uh, to really uh, understand this, the, the documents and the interaction that we have as people. And when you think about how uh, all this information comes together, that's how trust networks are built. That's how society uh, uh, works. And so we're really bringing back this local village, uh, which we actually have now. I mean, I get a friend request from Facebook across 3,000 miles in 30 years from people from high school. Uh, the world is really shrinking, and we have to understand that, and we have to understand it from a technology perspective and a policy perspective. And this really what I know is all about. We're trying to figure out how we all fit together and drive uh, some of these interesting applications. For example, how does my business fit with my customers? Do I look like the success profile of this company I'm about to uh, join? Do I look like the other employees that have been successful at this company? Would I? like living in this neighborhood? These are kinds of big questions that technology can start to give us some insight into, uh, which is really interesting. From a technology perspective, because I, as I said, I wear two hats, a policy hat and a technology hat, uh, we take billions of records and we cluster them based on or block them based on name and other blocking keys. And we try to figure out which of these billions of records go with the right person. For example, Carol Brooks is a very common name. There's not, not, we have 9,800 records for Carol Brooks. There's about 1,250 people named Carol Brooks. Which records go with which people? That's the problem. And so we cluster these records uh, into a graph, and it's about got 10 billion nodes, and there's probably about 100 billion edges on this graph, and then we cluster up these records. And you can see at about 10 o'clock, there's Jim Adler from Houston, Texas. He's the most famous Jim Adler, not me. Uh, he's this uh, ambulance chasing lawyer down in Houston, which is the bane of my existence, because he always ranks higher than me on Google. I'm, the, I'm this lowly guy at about uh, 7 o'clock uh, from Redmond, Washington, with just a smattering of records. And there, all the other Jim Adlers are, are, are in this cluster of, of records. 
this iNome engine that, we, that we've built takes in all this information, uh, names, places, phones, court records, news blogs, all kinds of information, uh, standardizes it, validates it, extracts uh, structured data from unstructured data, puts it in a unified data model that we call the iNome data model, does the blocking we talked about, does a record linkage problem, uh, uh, or solves a record linkage, pro linkage problem linking these uh, records together, and then clusters them, puts a full text search engine around them, throws them in a document store, and that when you hit developer.inome.com, the API is there, you get the results of that process. Okay? Act one. How did we get here? Well, this time last year, uh, I was, did a panel with Solomon Barakas, who uh, is a uh, studying privacy policy at NYU, and Alex Howard from O'Reilly was moderating uh, the panel, and we were going through some of the issues of the day around po uh, privacy and technology. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Daniel Tunkelang uh, uh, sent an interesting tweet, always insightful, always instigating. Uh, Daniel asked a pretty insightful question. He said, on inferring private facts from public data, does condemning those inferences define a new category of thought crime? And we sort of looked at each other, tap danced our way through the answer. I, I, I certainly was not satisfied with the answer. I imagine Daniel wasn't satisfied with the answer either. Uh, and that, it just started to gnaw at me. Uh, and I started to think about this uh, a little bit more deeply. And I said, okay, let's go back to basics and understand what thought crime is. And of course, thought crime comes from George Orwell's famous uh, book, 1984, written in 1948. Uh, and this, I think, is the the most important quote uh, that defines thought crime, it contains all other crimes in itself. Thought crime is what they called it. And you go back about 2,600 years to Lao Tzu, he kind of voices the same idea. Thoughts become words, your words become actions, actions become habits, habits character, and character becomes your destiny. So everything begins with thought. And if you want nothing bad to happen, don't think. Fair enough. I don't think that's practical. And so we need a framework with which to understand that when you do a big data inference, that's a thought, effectively. What you do with that thought, though, is the subject of, uh, uh, or needs to be, uh, the subject of quite a bit of consideration. And so to help that, I put out, probably over a year ago, this Places, per Players, Perils, Privacy Framework, which tries to decompose this. Uh, privacy dilemma into places that are public or not public, public or private, the, player, the players that are involved, and the power disparity, most importantly, uh, between those players. Bruce Schneier talked about this years ago, actually, that when you have a larger power gap between the players, you have higher uh, privacy regulation and consideration. For example, between peers, not much, between a company and a, and a, a citizen, a lot, uh, and or statutory, let's be more precise than a lot, statutory, and between government and a citizen, you have constitutional protections. So back at Strata uh, a year ago, we went through a graph that looks like this, is, and it decomposes these three uh, components, more private places along the x-axis, more power gap on the y-axis, and the size of the ball is how perilous it is. So stuff on the top left is the government using public data. The bottom right are your peers using private data. And we're going to talk a little bit about predictive policing in this talk. So that's why that, the, that hence the orange ball. OK? And so after this uh, strata, I really wanted to, and, and I gave a talk at the, the, the one in New York that sort of went through some of this thinking. I wanted to actually put some meat on these bones and try to really understand it. And uh, we uh, at iNome have a lot of uh, uh, data about people. We have criminal data. And so we sort of postulated uh, a question uh, around classifying felons. And let me just shout out to a few contributors here. Jeremy Kahn is a senior scientist, and Deepak Konadena is one of our software engineers. They've done, they did great work in bringing some of this to the fore. Uh, and we've, we've made it available on GitHub, so you can check it out. But the, the, the classifier's goal is pretty simple. If someone has minor offenses on their criminal record, do they also have any felonies? 
Uh, we'll discuss whether we should do this in a bit, but the question is, can we even do it at all? And applications could mean possible applications uh, of, of resource in a law enforcement context, uh, and, and there may be others. We don't really consider the applications. We really consider the classifier uh, and, and its performance but, and, it, and the policy implications. But there's some motivations here, and because you might ask, why are we doing this? Well, I think it's important that we ask hard questions, uh, especially of this technology that we're all running very hard toward. And I think it's, we are running toward this technology um, in, in three different camps. I call them the suits, the wonks, and the geeks. Uh, the suits are the business guys, and of course they want to make their numbers and, and, and make the business successful for their business and their shareholders. Uh, the wonks are the policy folks, and the geeks are the technologists that are actually making it happen. The challenge is that they often work in silos and they don't talk uh, until maybe a court proceeding, which is probably too late. Uh, or uh, a piece of legislation that gets uh, passed uh, that freezes up the market. So I think it's important the costs are relatively minimal to deal with these issues up front and now than later when things sort of get calcified and expensive to, uh, uh, to, to mitigate. So, and, and I call this responsible innovation. Everybody wants to innovate, but I think we all would agree that responsible innovation, if we could define it, would be the preferable path. And then we also want to explore the data and showcase a little of our technology. So let's dig in here a little bit. Uh, a few definitions. I don't know how many data scientists we have in, in the crowd, uh, but I'm, I'm sure we have a few. But l let me just, because this stuff does get a little confusing, let's just define in the context of the classifier what a positive is. A positive is this defendant has at least one felony. A negative is this defendant has no felonies, but they might have lesser offenses and, and do have lesser offenses. And so the classifier performance comes into this true positive negative and false positive negative uh, uh, set of possibilities. The true positive is they correctly, the classifier correctly identifies a felon. A true negative, the classifier correctly ignores someone who isn't a felon. The false positive and false negatives are the interesting part. The false positive incorrectly identifies a felon who isn't a felon. And the false negative incorrectly ignores a felon. Okay? So let's put put this in real world context. Your daughter just gets engaged. Okay? A false positive on her fiance, uh, a, fa a false negative, let's start with a false negative. A false negative impacts your daughter, right? Because you've basically missed that her fiance is a felon. A false positive, however, impacts your relationship with your daughter. Why? Well, you basically just called her fiance a felon and he isn't one. So with that grounding, let's talk about how we walk through this. We have in our criminal data about 250 million defendants. And they're in Avro files. And you look at this data and you're saying, US only, 250 million defendants. That can't be right. It's too many. <laughs> uh, and, it's sure, and sure enough, it is, uh, and because it's full of duplicates. So what we do is we put it through the iNome engine that we talked about earlier that is a, essentially a record linkage engine. And we crunch it down to 40 million defendants. And there's 650, 630 million criminal offenses in this data. And then we fan it out across the states. And depending on what state they go into, it depends on whether that defendant had uh, offended in that state. So if a, a defendant has offended in many states, uh, they'll be in many states. So we picked a state pretty much at random, small enough that the data wasn't so huge, but large enough that we can get some interesting uh, data. And we narrowed it down to Kentucky, uh, the lucky winner, and has 60,000 defendants. And then we had to put a noise filter uh, through the, uh, that data through a noise filter because each offense needs to have a offense classification. Is it a misdemeanor or a felony? And it turns out that a lot of these classifi classifications that, are, that come from the county and the state are very ambiguous. Like the offense classification will be this offense could be a felony or a misdemeanor doesn't really help us. So we throw all those offenses away. And about three quarters of them get thrown away. And we end up with 15,000 uh, defendants uh, with offenses that, are, uh, that, that we can use. And the data looks something like this. So on the top is pred prediction data. And you notice uh, this is broken down to offenses and a, and a profile, some personal data. 
And you can see in, in yellow, I highlighted whether it's a misdemeanor or the offense class. In this case, prediction data only has misdemeanors or lower. And the training label, same person, you notice the key is the same. The offense class is F for felony. So this is our label data at the bottom. So then in model training, we actually take this data, which is uh, symbolized on, on the left there, and we extract features from it. We bounce it against the labels, and we train a learner to determine whether, based on this non-felony information, could this profile, could this defendant actually be uh, a felon. And then in model operation, you don't have any uh, label data, you just have the raw prediction data, you throw it through the model, and it gives you, hey, does this person have any felonies or not? And so when you think about it, there's really three pieces to this. There's you extract the features from the data, you learn something, and you make a decision. And what's interesting is you don't really have to be a machine learning expert to uh, extract features. You really have to be a, a domain expert, not a, a, a domain expert, say, a, a, in a, crimino a criminologist, not necessarily a machine learning expert. And so for this, we looked at several features. Body marks, has a tattoo, is male, hair color, eye color. What's interesting that we found in the data, we found skin color in the data, which kind of surprised us. But we threw it in there anyway. Uh, the state puts it in there, we used it, and it's going to be interesting in a few slides of what we found. And then on the criminal profile, we counted the number of offense, offenses, and we, we flagged whether it was only traffic or not. And of course, these are very simple features. Uh, uh, the, and you could really go on ad nauseum on more features uh, that would uh, result in a better classifier. We just wanted to sort of take an initial stab at it. Uh, a feature looks something like this. This actually pulls eye color out of, the, uh, out of the data. There's a lot of noise in the data, so you can see there that if, it, if eye color is HZL or HAZEL or HAZ or uh, HAZ, EL or AL, it actually resolves to Hazel. So this is not data that we really control. The state controls uh, and the county controls. So we have, to, we have to normalize it. And so we have some tools in-house that deal with some of this. Gasket is a, a tool we use in Python that moves data between Avro and JSON and YAML. And then we have a, a, a Python framework. The felon detector itself is available, like I said, on I, uh, the iNome GitHub repo uh, at that URL. So how'd we do? Uh, the felon classifier, here's uh, what's a typical performance curve. Uh, the, but I really usually see performance re, uh, precision recall curves here. I, I don't like that because the in intuition is what is the false negative, false positive rate? Uh, and so for this classifier, the origin is the best classifier. It has zero false positives, zero false negatives. Okay? And so for a given profile, the model computes a score based on the features that comes in, based on eye color, hair color, all the other, all the, uh, the features that we talked about. And it computes a score, and then the classifier has to actually see whether that score justifies calling this person a felon or not. And this is where things get interesting. Because if you look at this false positive, false negative curve, it's really an anarchy tyranny curve. Uh, if you look at, uh, say, zero uh, false positive, rate. Uh, that means there's, we're never classifying anyone a felon. We're missing all of them. That means this classifier doesn't find anything. Uh, if, you know, as you, as you move down uh, the false positive curve uh, and you get to the point where the false negatives sort of drop, 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 you start catching everybody. And then you catch too many people. So you have to pick an operating point. And this is where the policy comes in. Because, for example, if I pick a threshold of 1, 1.01 1 .01 here on the, on the left, the false positive rate is 1%, and the false negative rate is 40%. So that means 1% of the time, I actually call someone a felon who isn't a felon. And usually, we have a presumption of innocence in this country, so you want to be more conservative. Uh, but you also uh, miss 40% of the felons. If you move down the curve to, say, only a 5% a five false positive rate, you call 5% of the population uh, felons who are not, but your false negative rate uh, drops to 22%. And if you go all the way to the end, your false negative rate uh, is, is zero. You don't miss anybody. 
but you miscategorize t almost 20% of the people, one in five, right? So you look at Kentucky, and that's 12,000 people that you've misclassified. That's a problem. That's definitely a headline. So this is uh, the alternating decision tree that is the model. I know it's an eye chart. I'm going to zoom in in a second. But this is, and, and there's many machine learners that are opaque. They don't, uh, they don't give you uh, much insight to how it's picking, how it's choosing. Uh, the decision tree actually gives you some insight into how it's making its determination. So you can actually look and say which features matter here. Uh, and so you go to one part of the tree. Uh, and remember the features that we talked about earlier. Uh, this is if, if the person is, and I, I don't know if you can see the highlighting, but I'll just kind of go through the right side of this. If the person is not male, so is male true is no, uh, and the skin color is light, give that person 1.8 points. But of course, if they're, if they're not male, you subtract uh, 0.5 points. Uh, and then, by the way, the way this works is the dotted lines is you do all, both branches, the solid lines, you only do one branch. Uh, it's binary uh, on the solid branches. And then if the number of offenses is less than 4.5, you add 5.7, and if, if it's not, you only add 5.538. So you compute this score, and for this one, for this, for this case, all the way through this branch, this, all the way to the right branch, uh, the score is 7. And if you remember from the previous slide, uh, a threshold of 1.01 .01 has a false positive rate of 1. If we, and so that's a, a pretty conservative threshold. That, this person would be classified as, as a felon. If you look at another side of the curve, which was disturbing to us uh, when, when this popped out, uh, if you look at this number of fences, less than three and a half, and skin color is dark, or hair color is black, you end up with a score of two, which is clearly classified as a felon. And this is just what the data is telling us based on, on these features. Now, you start to think about, uh, is there noise in the data? Is it, it, if someone's classified a felon, uh, uh, is the data uh, uh, filled in more uh, accurately or at least uh, is more attention given to those profiles? For example, is skin color only filled in for felons or not felons? So you have to ask a lot of these questions about noise in the data uh, because it really does beg the question, should, uh, even assuming the data is really pristine, maybe you want this class to be colorblind to a few of these features. And you very well may want them to be because it has, ma it has major legal implications. And so finally, let's talk about closing arguments, or what are the, what are the policy implications uh, of this classifier? So if you remember back to our uh, places, players, perils uh, chart, we're actually focusing again on the top left. And there's been a lot of legal work around these kinds of uh, inferences and how they lead to actions. And when it comes to the government, the Fourth Amendment is our check on government abuses. And there are principles of reasonable suspicion. Can you profile someone in order to uh, uh, profile someone or, or a place in order to help law enforcement do their job better. So we'll look at quickly uh, geographic profiling, criminal profiling. There is a ton of legal work on this. Uh, the best, one of the be better balanced articles is Predictive Policing by uh, Andrew Ferguson at uh, University of uh, DC Law. Uh, on the other side, or on the side against profiling is Bernard Harcourt from Chicago Law. Uh, and then the counterpoint to, to uh, Bernard Harcourt is uh, Yoram Margalioth, uh, who uh, basically says profiling's fine. Uh, and we're going to talk about why that, wh you know, what the issues are in a second. But it really comes down to reasonable suspicion. What gives the government any right uh, to suspect you? And courts have really upheld profiling. Uh, there was a case in 1989, U.S. Sokolow, and uh, this was a kid who went from Hawaii to Florida, two-day trip, paid in cash, fake name. The DEA just picked him out based on that profile, uh, arrested him, and the case held up in court. And it was pretty much just probabilistic profiling. Uh, I think, though, you have to look at these other 
these other pieces of data, for example, uh, is this particularized to a specific person or place? Right? Is the, is, the, is the classifier, is the inference uh, reasonable enough and particular enough to somebody? Is it detailed? So you can't just say all males. It's got to be particular to a specific uh, person that actually doesn't uh, ensnare everyone. And it has to be timely. Criminal data tends to have a, 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 a short time constant. And it's got to be corroborated by other information, other witnesses. So there's a couple of profiling cases uh, that are being that are moving into the marketplace now. One is called geographic profiling. And it, what it tries to do, and, uh, and actually IBM has a really interesting commercial, I don't know if you guys have seen it, uh, where it's sort of a split screen between the officer looking at his forecast, going to the, the 7-Eleven or the convenience store, and then at the same time the, the criminal is getting ready to hit the convenience store. And so by the time the criminal comes to the convenience store, the cop is sort of just leaning on his hood waiting for him. And the crook just sort of turns around and runs away. Uh, and so there is something to this. And there's a company uh, by the name of Predpol uh, that is bringing this to market. And it's successful. And this is a curve of one of their pilots that shows crimes per day dropping uh, after they uh, instituted it. There's a quote here by the LA police uh, chief, William Bratton, that uh, we're going to be able to anticipate uh, where a crime is likely to occur and uh, dispatch resource to that. Uh, they're doing it in a very interesting way. They're not just saying, hey, here's a bad neighborhood, put more cops there. What they're doing is taking a very small swath of, of, of real estate, 500 by 500 feet, and saying that's a hot spot. And they're deploying, and the forecast would deploy resources to that hot spot. Of course, if someone's in the hot spot, it doesn't necessarily mean they're a criminal. Of course, it's got to be corroborated. By, uh, by police. But what's interesting it, from a Fourth Amendment perspective is what happens, so you make the case, you find someone in the hot spot and they're acting, sus further, in, further, uh, they're acting suspiciously. So between these two things, you stop them, the cop stops them. That holds up in court because you got an, a tip basically from the computer and the person was acting suspiciously. What happens if the person is two blocks outside of the hot spot. Do they still have a, does the cop still have a case? Because he, they, they use the case that they were in the hot spot. What happens when they're really just right outside the hot spot? Is that, and, and the answer to that is nobody knows yet because these cases are going to be moving into the courts. From a criminal profiling perspective, uh, a profile is, is analogous to a computerized tip. Uh, and it is specific to a specific person. Some of the knock on, on geographic profiling is that it's not specific, which is why you need corroboration from a police officer. Uh, in a profiling sense, you, you have the specific person. Uh, and courts have, as I said, upheld uh, profiling as a reasonable factor. Uh, Bernard Harcourt says that, you know, it just, this just feels bad. It just violates this, this fairness principle that we all have the same right of being caught, or the same chance of being caught, rather. Uh, and Harcourt further says that this ends up in this weird kind of ratcheting problem that you look, you're looking for criminals in this profile and then you find some and you give that back to your algorithm, your classifier, and your classifier is reinforced by that information that forces you into looking for more people with that profile. And that, that's a problem. And he makes this really interesting point around uh, he's in Chicago, so there's the south side of Chicago and the, and the north side of Chicago. And he said, uh, on the south side of Chicago, there's a lot of drug, uh, drug dealing. And those folks may be uh, insensitive to policing because it's just there, it's that there's economic imperatives, that is, which is the reason why they're dealing to begin with. Uh, and of course, you're going to find criminals there. However, they're selling drugs to the, folk, the, the folks on the north side of town who are very sensitive to policing. So it, it may make sense in the broader scheme to send police to where the, the population is more sensitive to policing than continue just to fish for uh, uh, folks that are inelastic to that kind of activity. You end up with this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. There is a, a, a Judge Beckham from North Carolina said, uh, all looks yellow to the jaundiced eye. 
So you're, you're, you're focusing on, on this group, then you're pulling data that focuses you more on the group, and it, it ends up not being fair. You end up with, with arguably a, a, a worse situation. So in summary, I think the, the outcome of all this is that big data inferences are, are thought. They are not crime, Daniel. You'll be happy to know. Uh, speech and action, however, that flow out of these inferences could very well be criminal. So I would say think carefully and act carefully. Uh, we are embarking on a very exciting time, and I, and I feel that the, these policy discussions have to go alongside the technology innovations. If you want more information, uh, uh, the slides will be made available. Uh, the classifier is up on GitHub. Uh, check out our APIs. Uh, I think I have time for a few questions, but I appreciate your time. Yes, sir. So really good question. So those that didn't hear, the question is, where is the money modifier in this? Is so, so are lower income people more likely to be in the felon camp because uh, they can't plea bargain their, their, their way down than more wealthy individuals, if I captured that correctly? That's right. And, so, and when we started to look at this, and, and, and you would argue a good feature would be income level of the defendant and to see if that actually does impact this. My guess is it probably would. Or asset, actually asset yeah, some sort of asset measurement. Do you have the, 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 the assets to, to not be labeled uh, in such a way? And I, and I think that is easily one of, the, one of the things you would have to look at in, in, in this sort of uh, analysis. I think that would change this income down to less than Yeah. It could be, yeah, it could be that just uh, uh, skin color is just a, a uh, is correlated very close to, to income in that area. Income or asset. Income or asset, right, exactly. Yes, sir. I think that's going to be exactly where the courts are going to go, right? If I if I if 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 I'm if I'm de defending someone or I'm the defendant and and I am uh, I was class I was profiled and I would look and say what are the features in that profile and I would say I know the ones that are illegal I would say I would look at the ones that correlated well with with the ones that are illegal and I would say there's an equivalence there therefore you got to throw out the classification and throw out uh, the case. I think that that is going to be a classic line of defense uh, as these things move through the courts. Absolutely. And, and that argues for, as data people, that we look at these sort of correlations and, and, and have these sorts of discussions. Maybe, I think in the, in the long run, there's going, to be, uh, there's going to be pushback on some of, these, uh, some of these practices and even some of these laws. That you know, where is the where what what's what is the right what is the right of the society? What is the right of the individual? And this is always where this tension is going to come from. And uh, I expect more and more uh, uh, definitive uh, uh, decisions coming from the courts on this. The reality is, profiles are already okay, except a certain set of uh, criteria. Protect what's called protected classes. Uh, everything else is fair game. But to your point, sir, that they are highly correlated, uh, uh, or other things are highly correlated with things that are illegal. Yes, sir, in the back.
much that big data that is clean and, and I, I'm worried I, I'm already to, I want to know how do you guys deal with the selection bias all that data sent in the first place. Do you guys match that data with known values? Oh yeah. Oh so so in the in the uh, so in the data there's uh, many cases, I don't, I don't know what the split is, uh, of uh, folks that have misdemeanor or just traffic and no felons. But there's still a, there's, there's still a selection bias on the, even, even for the guys who traffic, right? Yes, yeah, I, yeah exactly. There, there, there certainly is. Uh, the, I mean, if we just threw out everybody who uh, uh, had no felonies, that would be a huge selection bias. Uh, but yeah, it could be people that get ensnared in the criminal justice system, even for traffic, could bias things uh, in a lot of different ways. Anything else? Great. Hey, thanks, everybody. Uh, like I said, there's office hours tomorrow. If, uh, if uh, you sleep on this and have some questions, feel free to drop by. I'd be happy to uh, discuss this with you. Thanks a lot.